Welcome to this WIFTY World webinar. So wonderful to have you. I know you're out there, although I can't see you. Uh, thank you for being here for this conversation on cinema and activism in Bangladesh. I'm Simone Pirro, WIFT International Board Member and producer based in New York and founder of Four Impact Productions. And for us at WIFTI, it's always such a pleasure to travel all across the world to meet filmmakers, their activist work and their films. So really excited uh, to have you here for today's talk. As usual for our format, uh, we will hear a 30 minute conversation first, and we'll then take about 30 minutes uh, for audience questions. Um, so before I hand it over to our moderator, Rabi Yat, uh, and our wonderful guests, just a reminder to please introduce yourself in the chat if you like, uh, with your name and where you're from. Uh, and then please, if you do have questions, uh, put them in the special Q&A field at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer them in the second half. So uh, it's my great pleasure to hand this over now to Rabi Yat. Thank you, Simone. Hello. It's such a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar today. And um, my name is Rubaya Hussain. Uh, I'm a film director and producer. I'm from Bangladesh and I live between Bangladesh and the US. I'm also on the WIFTI board. Um, and today we're going to talk about film and activism in Bangladesh, um, or may, not in Bangladesh, we have filmmakers with us who also work outside of Bangladesh, but we want to really talk about what it means to be a woman and want to make films in Bangladesh. Um, and we have with us Farzana, Zana Shammi, and Elizabeth De Costa. Hi. Hello. Hello. So I want to introduce uh, both of these filmmakers. I, I really admire their work. Um, I think their work is very important. Um, I came to know about Zana Shami through her film, Untying the Knot, which is a feature length documentary, uh, which was in Hot Dogs in 2019. And prior to that, she has made a short film which um, has um, aired in television in Canada. She's a Canadian Bangladeshi filmmaker who mostly lives and works in Canada, but Untying the Knot was um, shot in Bangladesh. It's about Bangladeshi women surviving domestic violence. Uh, and you can know more about her through the bio that we post in the chat box. Um, and Elizabeth De Costa. Um, I think she's a very exciting, one of the most exciting uh, young uh, directors coming out of Bangladesh right now. Um, I came to know her through her um, recent film, Bangla Surf Girls, which uh, just premiered um, at Hot Dogs this year, right, Elizabeth? Um, and she has also worked with BBC Action and uh, yeah. filled me in. <laughs> no, I worked in the nationally and internationally, like PBS NewsHour, SBS. I work as a stringer too, uh, as a documentary filmmaker, as a yeah stringer. And um, I think it's interesting because Elizabeth has studied uh, media, media studies, and film in Bangladesh. So she has done this full journey from being uh, a film student in Bangladesh and then making films locally and then also working internationally. Uh, so today we really want to talk about um, what it actually means. What, what are the experiences in making films in Bangladesh? Because I think as women, the challenges are pretty much similar across the globe. But then also there's, uh, you know, specific conditions, um, specific culture, specific, you know, uh, con social and religious context that makes uh, the journey of women directors kind of uniquely different um, from one space to the other. And today we want to talk about, you know, these directors who are making films in Bangladesh. So uh, the first question I want to pose, you know, 
to, to Zana Shami is, um, you know, also, you know, we will come to Elizabeth back with this question that you chose to make a film about, you know, women overcoming oppression and violence and exploitation in a, in a deeply patriarchal society. Uh, and while making the film, while engaging with the survivors, uh, what was your experience? Did you feel like you gained something, you know, as a woman? And were there any changes that happened in you or the characters of your film um, in the process of making the film itself and the process of distributing and showing the film um, across the globe? And Thanks. you know, before we go to her, before we go to her uh, to hear the answer, we would like to watch the trailer, so we sure. have context when when she speaks. খুব ছোট বেলায় তো অনেক ফ্যান্টাসি জগতে থাকলাম তখন অনেক ফ্যান্টাসি রিলেটেড ড্রিম ছিল আমার স্বপ্নে পুরুষটা এমন হবে আমি মনে করলাম যে সে খুব কেয়ারিং হবে আমার প্রতি এবং আমাকে বুঝতে পারবে রেসপেক্ট দ্য মোস্ট ইম্পর্টেন্ট থিং রেসপেক্ট দ্যাট আই নিড ফ্রম সামওয়ান আই ওয়াজ আ ভেরি ফ্রি স্পিরিট আই হ্যাড দ্যাট ফ্রিডম অফ মেকিং ডিসিশনস ফর মাই লাইফ got married and my dreams were completely shattered sometimes i feel i'm tied up with the rope i really don't want to remember those days because it was horrible because he used to beat me <laughs> Okay, well, what an inspiring uh, piece of work, Zana. So tell us more. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that's a great question though. Uh, like the filmmaking is a whole process. It's a journey, as you know. And in this journey, I learned a lot uh, working with these uh, like uh, women. And it's really, uh, I'm thankful to those women. They shared their story. They trusted uh, me to tell their story. Uh, in in that way uh, so i'm really uh, grateful to them so uh, in the beginning uh, like definitely i was aware of domestic violence abuse uh, in bangladesh or all over the country but uh, to be honest like uh, i was very naive to believe that uh, like it doesn't happen in like educated empowered uh, family like me uh, so like middle class upper middle class so when uh, rumana manzoor my uh, main subject in my film uh, we went to high school together in bangladesh so when the incident happened uh, that uh, actually shook me like it it was like so shocking for me i could i was in denial because as i said that i couldn't process the whole thing that something can happen uh, to someone like me, like and I, who I grew up with, who I know. So then I started actually digging up uh, what, what's exactly going on in Bangladesh. But uh, I, I got to learn more uh, that domestic abuse is not only a third world country or um, women who are uneducated or uh, not empowered. It happened all over the globe. And uh, the numbers are really staggering. So, uh, and then I, uh, when I uh, had, uh, like when I was doing the research and most of the people, they got to know me, like my friends, 
and relatives, they all know that I have been uh, working in this uh, particular project. And then uh, the thing happened, a lot of women, like even my friends, my relatives, they came up to me to share their stories, which was amazing. Like I, I, could, I, I didn't, uh, believe that so many people can uh, come up can come up to me and open up their stories but surprisingly like uh i realized that i feel like every other woman who i knew has been going through some sort of abuse and another thing i learned when i was working in this uh project that abuse is not only physical Abuse could be emotional, abuse could be financial. There are so many different layers of abuse. And so in this process of filmmaking, I learned those at the same time when I was creating awareness uh, for, for my subjects and for my film, like film audience as well. So, but uh, that's how uh, the whole uh, journey uh, started and I started digging up more and more. And I realized that my main subject, Romana Manzur, although she was an international student in uh, Canada, Vancouver, Canada, uh, and the story is like the incident happened in Bangladesh. So at the, to relate to this whole, uh, her story and to connect what exactly the present situation in Bangladesh, I had to go back to Bangladesh and find uh, other similar stories to show the uh, broader pictures. So that's when uh, it, I started going back and forth to Bangladesh and I experienced a lot different scenarios and different uh, stuff. And as you uh, asked that like, how it changes my uh, subject's uh, life. Uh, I would say that definitely uh, as I learn so much about uh, domestic violence in different uh, aspects, different layers, it, as it's not only physical. So at the same time, while we were shooting, we were discussing all this thing. We became like a very close, as you know, documentary filmmaking is not a huge team. It's a very, uh, like very compressed, very short team. So we are just, I guess, five uh, crew in the film, in the team and the subject. We became like a family every day. We spend so many days and um, even before we start shooting, at the developing stage or research stage, I was going back and forth and I was spending time with them. So that's how we became very close, uh, like family uh, group. So they shared a lot of their stuff with me and we shared our stories, our personal uh, life. So that's how we realized that uh, there are a lot of information gap about abuse, about domestic violence and women's rights. So, uh, so that's what we try to, you know, uh, share our knowledge, whatever I learn, whatever uh, they have the idea. So, and the, uh, an experience in Bangladesh, like I, I never had, I grew up and raised in Bangladesh, but I, I was born in a huge family. So I never had to experience how it, it feels like uh, to, to live uh, by yourself and what are the struggles or what are the challenges. So those women, like one of uh, my subjects, she was living at the end of uh, the film, she was living by herself. And so like, I learned all those things. How are the struggles? It's very hard to find a rental place even just because you are a single woman. And those are the struggles uh, like I never knew of. So I learned those things. And the best part I uh, felt for making this film, like another subject of mine, uh, Jasmine, she mentioned uh, after uh, we finished shooting and I came back, we were at the post-production. She mentioned that I inspired her so much. She was, at that time, she was a school teacher, a high school teacher, but uh, she uh, tried to apply different places and uh, she put that effort into her career instead of like 
always uh, thinking about families and uh, like, you know, uh, her husband, how her husband is treating her. So now she is working at a, a university, private university, and she, uh, she, she's so happy with her career. So that I felt like that's my best achievement when my subject says that I inspired her and she could make that changes in her life. Now she uh, close to her dream, uh, like career goal and everything. So I feel like, yeah, I guess that's how we make changes in the society, right? It's, uh, it's a little bit small, stuff it's uh, uh that's how i believe film documentary film or any film can uh like make impact in the society thank you so much it's so good to hear that um elizabeth i want to come to you with the same question but before that we will watch the trailer of your film um and you know, just reflecting on your film, it's about young women who are surfing in, in the coastal region of Bangladesh. So a, a really marginalized community, young women, you know, and doing something that's forbidden. Um, and so by that act, they're actually creating space for themselves in society. And you, by filming it, you're also creating more space for it. So, you know, we'd love to hear a a little bit about that also in your answer. But first, Regina, can we watch the trailer for Surfing Girls? সার্ফিং <laughs> <laughs> আমি আমার আম্মুর মতো হতে চাই না আমি আমার মতো হব ডেইলি না আমাদের ভালো লাগে আর মন সাগরের মধ্যে চলে যায় বলে লোকে বলে সারফিং এ যায় যায় ওরা মাগি ইন্ডিকে করে যারা খেলা দেন বাজি বেশায় জনের কত জগতা হল হত জনের কত বাসা চলে আসব আর মনেও করব না আমি সারফিং আসি সেটা আমার ভবিষ্যৎ আমি ঠিকটা Okay, Elizabeth, we want to hear from you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me today here. I'm really excited to talk about my film, These Girls. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, I would just want to say that this is the same thing what Zana was saying, that, you know, these girls trusted me. And when I first met them, they were selling at the beach, you know, their accessories and twinkle stuff. And then the same girls were roaming around with surfboard. It was a big contrast even to witness. Uh, and immediately I know, knew that it is a story that needs to be told, that needs to be captured. Um, because so many times we've seen girls coming from Bangladesh. Um, it, it's a story about survival. I felt like it's a story about dream and living freedom and surfing is kind of metaphor in this whole film for them. And when they first spoke to me, immediately we, we became good sisterhood sisters and they wanted to tell their stories. It's, it's 
I felt that strength, I learned a lot from them uh, throughout my filming. I felt they didn't want to give up whatever drudgery they had in their life. Uh, they, all, all of them come from a really, as uh, Rubaita Pui mentioned that, you know, marginalized uh, society, but they really wanted to make changes. And um, I tried to capture that as much as I could uh, for three years observing them. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I get like, suddenly I saw my own trailer. <laughs> well, tell, us, tell us a little bit about, you know, um, the, the process of filming with these girls and, you know, when now they know that your film has had a, a world premiere and yes. I know that you're planning to screen the film in Cox's Bazaar in this community with these girls. So tell us a little bit more about the process of making this film. And also like, I think maybe, maybe a lot of our guests don't know um, that how surfing could be such an impossible act in Bangladesh. So tell us a little bit more about that too. Yeah, um, so three years back, yeah, when I first met them and decided to, you know, go with the filming. And fortunately, I don't know, it was coincidental. I met Zana Pu's production and through her production, her producer and her producer asked me that, you know, if I have any stories and we talked and suddenly, yeah, while working with Zana Pu, it clicked, the story clicked with her producer. <laughs> Um, and we decided to do a small demo showreel and I went with my camera, I started filming since day one, as I said that, you know, before filming, they knew me as their sister and there was no kind of, you know, it, 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 it's different because people come and go from their uh, filming them, they come to their life, they film them and then they, they leave. But with me, they knew that, you know, I am going to be there. I was there before even filming. So the trust, the access was already set. Like I, I still, I am in contact with them. And I always used to tell them, you know, this is this, if they want to tell their stories, this is how I'm going to capture it. It's not, I'm not going to manipulate anything, not going to ask them to do anything or they should not do anything that I would like to show on camera, nothing like that. So they were aware, they, it took them time to understand this, this, this is not like a, you know, uh, interview and bureau kind of, you know, they will not understand it, but it took them time to understand the process. But when they understood that I was the only there with camera, they were like, okay, <laughs> yeah, we don't care. At one point they didn't even, there was no <laughs> line between camera and them, you know, they, they felt like they were talking to me. Um, yeah, and then, after filming for three years, we really became, as I said, that really became good friend. And it was, it's just for them, I still didn't do any kind of um, Bangladesh premiere, as I said. Um, so uh, I am excited about that. And I'm pretty sure because their family and uh, the, everyone will um be excited to see them uh, or the film yeah okay so I, I i'm gonna go to my second question um and i'll pose it to elizabeth and then we'll go to zana so have you ever faced a systematic exclusion from the space of filmmaking in bangladesh because of your gender um and what are some of the challenges of navigating uh, with the female body within a terrain of public space in bangladesh um, where women's bodies are not safe and in a in a culture where women are largely considered physically and intellectually inferior to men what does it really take to have a mastery over a medium which is technical like you have to be around camera and you have to command over a crew which is sometimes mostly male so how did you do this and what were your strategies and like give it to us in like a few minutes and then we go to Zana and then we open it up to the audience. 
Just to give quick context for Bangla Surf Girls, first I tried to film with the whole crew, uh, but then I realized the space and, and the challenges were different. And it was more, the scenes were more um, sensitive and they could come up more beautifully when I am on my own. So I took the camera on my own shoulder and I filmed and did the audio. But beside, uh, before that, I used to work uh, in different in different production with uh, male and you know there are male colleagues who I could say pretty much yeah it was hard for them to take um, a kind of uh, I should not say like if I give an instructions or if I want this and that as a director producer sometimes it was hard for them to. Um, I don't know, respect that, or sometimes it was hard for them to like believe that, okay, what she's saying, yeah, actually she knows what she's saying. Uh, for example, with the camera stuff, if, if I go and try and rent a camera, it looks like assistants or, or people around me are, you know, if I ask them questions, it looks like they're asking me question on top of questions. <laughs> because it's in their mindset that um, there are very rare, it's very rare to see a female videographer or female camera person in Bangladesh. I think more and more will come up, but um, it was, yeah, when I was filming, it was new for them to witness uh, a female videographer. And sometimes it, it works both way. When I'm in the very remote, areas where um, you know it's a very uh, village like really remote areas there people trust me to tell their stories uh, because they know I will not just go away I, I'm not just here with my camera like filming and then go away they know as a as a woman I do have that empathy i i have that patience to sit down and actually care and listen to someone's stories so i i i felt that 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 trust is there and i respect that and i i always take time for that that's one of the strategy and if you ask me uh <laughs> my strategy for like, you know, I mean, not strategy, like when, yeah, in Bangladesh, if I'm roaming around uh, wearing, you know, what do I wear and what am I wearing? It's very important. And the places where I go, it's very important whether I do have a proper scarf around me or not. And uh, uh, am I properly covered or not? For the sake of story, yes, I respect that. It's like there is a say in Bangla, like wherever I go, I try and you know mold my character according to that. But sometimes, yes, it, it is frustrating. Like, why do I have to, as a woman, <laughs> have to worry about my what I wear? Because at the same time, uh, the the uh, male person working in my production, he's he's roaming around with his shorts when there is hot summer. But I do have to worry about my clothes so yeah these are the these are the challenges that sometimes we have to yeah mole mole around and um, strategize and yeah it sometimes it frustrates and uh, sometimes we try and break it it's not like I don't wear westerns I do wear try and break it I was like I don't care today <laughs> I'm not in the mood <laughs> but yeah that's that's it from my side. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We'll ask the same question to Zana. Uh, it's more or less similar uh, experience since uh, uh, like uh, I work in Bangladesh, uh, like with Elizabeth. But uh, the one thing was more challenging for me was uh, that I am coming from uh, another country, right? Uh, I. I I, I, I don't live there. So I realized that was a challenge uh, for me to like, they treat me as a foreigner, although I was born and raised like half of my life in Bangladesh, but th th it doesn't count. The moment I'm like, they treat me as a foreigner and they try to 
teach me like all the norms and the stuffs in like Bangladesh, uh, which was uh, interesting uh, because I grew up in Bangladesh, so I'm familiar with everything. Uh, but at the same time, I felt like it's because uh, I'm a woman. That's why it's it's hard for them to accept and uh, accept instruction, or I would say like any uh, order, like as a director, to accept me as a director, I would say rather like they, uh, I find initially I found uh, like I experienced those challenge, but I would say at the same time, I, I really made some good friends, uh, male friends in uh, Bangladesh, like uh, as a crew. So they helped me. They never treated me as a woman. They're like equally treated me. I can just wear shorts and hang out with them or work with them. And at the same time, they covered me when we were uh, working in a public place where it was not very safe, the crowd or the like, or the bazaar or market where it was not safe for me, they covered me. They were like, keep me like surrounded so that no one can like say some bad thing, like, or, you know, do anything like inappropriate or say something inappropriate. And even while we were walking from one location to another location, constantly they are checking that if I am uh, walking uh, safe or I'm feeling comfortable. So uh, I would say that I have both positive and negative experience. Uh, so those friends are like, they're amazing friends. They never treated me as a woman or I'm not equal to them. I don't know anything. But at the same time, I have those challenges and experience as well, those negative uh, challenges. So the strategy mainly I followed like uh, for filming process. Uh, oh, so, uh, sorry, I forgot you mentioned that. Uh, I realized that as a woman, since my film is a woman's story and it's a very sensitive issue, I realized being a woman was, had an advantage at that point. Uh, I got the trust. I, I felt that connection. Although I never experienced any of this, I, I was just aware of the situation it helped me to connect with them. And, and I realize it's because I'm a woman. That is my power to connect with other people emotionally. Even like when I was, uh, if you see my uh, characters, I have male participants, right? Uh, the abuser is in my film. I think it's because I'm a woman, he felt that comfort, or I don't know, maybe he felt that he can say anything <laughs> to me. So that's how he opened up. So I, I realized that that's at one point, that is my advantage. I, I, I got that advantage. I'm not sure how any men can do it because, I'm not a man and I don't know uh, like how to function as a man. I, so that I felt it, it is my advantage uh, being a woman. And another thing you said, uh, the strategy. Uh, yeah, as uh, Elizabeth said, it's actually same. Uh, it's like, I believe when you are in Rome, be a Roman. So if I am in Bangladesh shooting, I, I don't mind following all those like dress code and everything. Yes, it is very annoying that I have constantly, instead of focusing on directing the scene or instead of focusing what's the question I'm gonna ask my interviewer, I'm constantly thinking, am I enough covered up so that no one can touch me inappropriately or no one can make any comments? You know, and, and another issue, as I mentioned, my biggest challenge was I'm not local, right? I'm coming from another uh, country. So I don't know, for some reason, people uh, see that it's like, 
uh, I'm just coming from some other country and I'm trying to show Bangladesh in a negative uh, like aspect, but that's not true. I was born in that country, right? I'm just trying to focus what needs to be fixed. And that's what film does, right? To focus on the things needs to be fixed and which needs to be, to create awareness. So, so these are the issue uh, I faced. And uh, as I say that I try to like dress appropriately to that uh, situation or to that location. But at the same time, when I am in like in a safe situation, like when I'm interviewing my uh, subjects at their place, I don't have to worry about my dress code or anything because uh, as I mentioned, I was, I luckily I got a fantastic crew. Although my final production, uh, it was all Canadian crew, we went there. But initially at the development stage, uh, I got fantastic crew from Bangladesh. Elizabeth was one of them. And there are a couple of male uh, a camera person and uh, assistant camera. So they were amazing. They like, I never felt uncomfortable uh, around them. I never felt unsafe around them. So I didn't have to worry what I'm worrying. I, I was very comfortable. I know they're there, so I don't have to worry about anything. I can 100% focus on uh, my uh, subject on uh, or the scene on director. So I guess I have both positive and negative uh, experience. So it's it's up to you, like where you focus. So mm -hmm. I always prefer to focus on positive things. So yeah. Thank you so much. Well, we only have like about 20 minutes. So um, we'd like to hear questions. You can type them up in the chat box and we'll try our best to answer all of them. Super. We had a couple of questions coming in um, and a lot of people wanted to know a bit more about your funding process, how both of you uh, filmed, uh, funded, sorry, funded your films. So maybe you could just talk a bit about that, how that worked out for you. Uh, can I just jump in and say one thing before you answer? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that it should be very inspired for our WIFTI family that Zana had actually met her producer in a WIFTI meeting in Toronto, right? And then through Zana, Elizabeth met her producer. So both of these meetings have a WIFTI connection. So yeah, yeah well, just... by the way, I was WIFT, uh, T WIFT Toronto member uh, before and uh, my producer is a WIFT Toronto member as well. So yeah, we are all uh, like member, ex-member of WIFT. <laughs> So shall I continue about the funding? Yes, yeah, yeah. You can start. yeah. Uh, so uh, the funding was initially, uh, as, an, as an emerging filmmaker, definitely funding was a struggle. Uh, but uh, the research stage, uh, I had to like spend from my own pocket, but uh, yeah, but the development stage, when I have like, uh, I collected, gathered, uh, all the information, I created a demo. So with that, I started pitching around uh, like the funders and uh, like broadcasters in Canada. So then at the development stage, I like CBC Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, they came on board. And so that's how I manage my funding. And we have like uh, other uh, funders here, Canadian uh, media, fund and then uh, Ontario uh, Media Fund. So we applied for those uh, funds uh, and uh, we uh, got those. So uh, after development stages and then we, for the production stage, when they liked the development uh, demo, the trailer and all the subjects uh, we uh, found uh, their stories. We captured those at the development stage and we pitch, uh, we showed that this, this is the story is gonna be like, and uh, they came on board, yeah. It's the biggest, like when the broadcaster came on board, I realized that it's, it's much more easier uh, to get other funding. 
Well, for Bangladesh Girls, yes, it's the same journey. Me and my producer, first we spend from our pocket <laughs> uh, for the research and development. And we went to um, uh, IPFA, International Documentary Festival in Amsterdam, and got some great ideas, talking to people in the meeting. And that's where we got involved with the chicken and egg. And uh, as a first Bangladeshi, uh, I was selected for chicken and egg uh, accelerator lab in 2017 where they give one year of mentorship and some funding. And that funding was really useful. Like that saved me <laughs> or that pushed me to, you know, uh, do a big, uh, big round of filming. So I started filming and taking their mentorship at the same time, which really helped. And after one year when, yeah, when we ran out of chicken and egg fund, uh, we decided, we approached a few, um, you know, uh, outside financer, but then um, when we saw the stories really evolving faster and faster, I, start, I kept on filming. Um, I went to some other side gigs to get some more, more money and put it in this in this film and at the same time my producer she was gathering you know from her own own um, own pocket she was gathering money to like you know uh, re get ready for the post the reason we went through this strategy is that because first we wanted to finish it and we wanted to make our own cut so right now we're looking for um you know we are we are having discussions about you know distributors and sales um and yeah, th this has been a journey, uh, funding. Yeah, still I'm learning a lot. <laughs> You're on mute, Rubat. We have a few more questions, I think, um, in the chat box. Yes. Um, so one person is wondering if there was any issues or if there was a lot of bureaucracy around your films to get your films out into the world. Um, is there anything that comes to mind uh, around bureaucracy and your films? Well, I think Wyatt can uh, say better than us. Yes. <laughs> we still didn't release this film, like both uh, Elizabeth and I, we are dying to release that in Bangladesh. We are waiting on that. <laughs> <laughs> You have to get through the sensor board, ladies. <laughs> get ready for the sensor board. Well, yeah. in Bangladesh, we have a we have a you know we have a sensor certificate that you have to obtain before we can screen a film publicly. So it makes our job as filmmakers really difficult because it's not just that you make films and you show it to the people; you actually bring it to the government, and they create a board of people. For example, if the film is about surfing girls, they probably have the right to bring somebody from that industry and have them sit on the board. Um, okay. If I make a film about the ready-made garment industry, they can get somebody from that industry and sit on the board to judge my film if it can get the certificate or not. So yeah, it's not so easy. I think we have some more questions in the uh, Q&A and we go to that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one other person who is wondering, they're a student right now. Um, and they're wondering how would you select a story that would be or will be suitable for you to make it as a as a full length feature, so that talks to um, sort of yeah finding the right story. Do you have any advice on that? Uh, I would say that uh, when you uh, when you get any stories or any subjects. Uh, I think you will realize that how how much materials you have it's it's a sense as a filmmaker I would say like initially I wanted to make a, a feature length just based on Romana but then I realized that uh, yes it's a huge uh, like story but at the same time I wanted to show a broad, broader aspect since it's a feature length I was thinking more how can I portray uh, like the broader aspect in 90 minutes or 120 minutes. So you can get the uh, 
uh, like sense of it. Like right now I'm working on another uh, film project. It's about mental health, but I know the materials I have, the story I have, it's not a feature length story, unless I found some more subjects or um, some more uh, stories. Uh, right now I can tell that I can make it, it it's basically a short. I can just stretch it to if I found another, uh, like if it goes to any direction which will be more interesting or something needs to be told, it could go until mid length. Mm -hmm. So I think like as any storyteller, you will get the sense how long it should be. Well, from my side, I would say that how would I select a story? Um, I, yeah, I think I, I love listening to people and it depends on how much, you know, uh, how much I can visualize. As a visual person, when someone is telling me stories, I really like to visualize that. And whether it will be feature, mid or short, I really don't think about that in the first few first few phase, let's say this way. First, I have to get the access. That's my first, um, if I like the story, let's say I love the story. I want to do my research. I want to go through the development phase. And if I have really compelling uh, characters that I want to follow, um, I follow them for first few, let's say weeks or, or months. I don't know, it depends on your uh, story. And then, um, by the, by the time it, 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 it evolves, the story talks to you. That's how I feel, that it evolves and, uh, and the visual evolves. And at one point you will just feel like, okay, this is what I want to do. I do not want to make it mid-length or feature. Like there was a point even with my film uh, in a festival, film festival that I was, uh, I was approached to make it short like give, give a shorter version, 25 minutes or 20 minutes, and immediately I could make money by giving that version because I had a lot of footage. But I, I was adamant, I knew that I had to see where this girl's life goes for the next few years. And so I didn't give it. And I knew inside me that I really wanted to make it full length. And now that I'm the productions that I'm working right now, I know it, it's just maybe it's after you find that story that talks to you and then you go ahead with it. And after a few, you know, after making maybe one film, now if I look at a story or a film, I immediately I can say that, you know, this one is short. This one is I want to make it longer version. So it's just, it just talks to me now. That's wonderful. Um, Robert, is there anything you'd like to add or shall we go to? Um, I think there is, yeah, I think we can go to the next question. I think we have a, one more question. Super. Um, yeah, Nancy uh, is wondering, like, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the process of filming with your participant or with your subject really works. How do you follow them? Like, do you, have you worked with them every day or every week or certain hours or how did that all work? And then maybe Elizabeth, you can also uh, come back to the question from the chat about how you filmed the surf shots, maybe as part of that. Oh yeah, I saw Nancy's uh, <laughs> question. Uh, as I was explaining, I filmed with GoPro on board as well as there was someone in the water trying to get the same shot from a little bit side angle because I loved it. That person was also on board because he was a surfer. I used surfer to get that shot from the side. And to get the long shot, I was on the, on the shore because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> um, yeah, so match cut with three cameras, let's say, and most of the time I filmed. And to answer Nancy's second question, um, because I was working with uh, under, uh, under 18 kids, right? They're, they were 12, 13 when I was filming them. I really didn't want to, uh, how should I say? I prioritized them, their time. I didn't follow any you know, time and schedule. Like I, I, I went along with their, their timing. Um, uh, maybe it's because you can say my previous 
past work experience with BBC Media Action <laughs> came back in my head that if you work with the kids, this, this, this things you have to maintain. So I don't know. I, it was in my head all the time. Like I have to maintain um, what I say, what I do in front of kids. Um, so every, every, it was sometimes every day. Sometimes I was with camera every day or sometimes even there were months and months I was just there without camera. Um, yeah, the camera was just just there on my shoulder, but I didn't use it. I was just roaming around with them. Um, sometimes it was all day. I could only shoot one scene. And, I, and there was a moment I waited whole day and I shot one single scene at 12 in, at midnight. <laughs> so it, it was more likely, I would say, I, I, it was in my head that I would just observe whatever they go through and whenever they give time. And that's, that's how I film them, yeah. In my case, so uh, I wasn't uh, lucky to, <laughs> like Elizabeth, I couldn't just stay with them since I live here. Uh, but yeah, so we, uh, how we do it, like when we uh, started, uh, like developing the stories when I sit with them to know their daily routines and uh, we planned it out actually. So uh, maybe we are following daily routines. So all those their daily, how their day-to-day uh, -day routines goes. So few days we, uh, we shoot those things like just the daily routine. And if any is a uh, specific, uh, occasion is coming uh like uh, for romana we romana gave us when is her graduation uh, ceremony so we focus we fix that day we are shooting all day her uh graduation and uh when she's doing any special occasion that's we schedule other than that we uh maybe follow them uh for uh, three days four days at the same time and uh we we hold the shoot for uh, that special occasion. And on that special occasion, we shot uh, that whole uh, event, whole ceremony. And then maybe we shot a couple more days to get the reactions or uh, interview her after that. So especially we focus like uh, a day for interview and uh, then all their day-to-day -day life, depending on story, you will do that. So when you have the story, especially in documentary, we follow subjects. So you will get, when you uh, get to know your subject, when you get the sense of the story, how the story might evolve, as uh, Elizabeth said, the story will speak to you. As a storyteller, you will know how the story might uh, go which way it should it will it, definitely you will have a plan that you want the story ideally you want the story to go in that way but yeah. at the same time you have to have plan b or c that it might not go in that way which way it should go so you plan the accordingly and you you uh, schedule your uh, shooting uh, as per uh, that uh, order okay. i think that I makes think sense that's <laughs> we have, I think we can, we, we're running out of time, but I think, I think we can, we have some very interesting questions, so maybe we can take a few more questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe one or two more we have time for. Um, what is the current status of your participants and subjects in the films? Are you still in contact with them? What are they up to now? Has the film maybe affected them or the films, um, are the film affected them in any kind of way? Um, yes, let's do that one. Uh, yeah, I'm still in touch with them. Uh, like I'm in touch with like Romana is my friend. So definitely I'm in touch with her. Uh, but other than Romana, three other subjects, Jasmine, Naima, uh, Charmaine, I'm in touch with them on Facebook, on like WhatsApp. So we are uh, like we chat whenever anything happens. We like, yeah, we are in touch. But as of for me, my three characters of the film, we I'm still in contact with them. And I can't wait, I can't wait to go back. I'm going back to Cox's Bazaar. <laughs> I, I'm finally moving 
in Cox's Bazaar. And uh, I think uh, after Hot Dogs, we got some really good um, response from people who really want to help them or try and see for their future, like, uh, which was my initial plan. Uh, me and my producer plan was like to get some impact campaign through this, to, through this film. Um, so yeah, we're trying to set that up so that people can directly help them and they can help themselves. I think I, that's what I'd say first <laughs> before people helping them. They really understand. Yeah, I think, yeah, I will be able to be there with them, spend more time with them, yeah. Great, so maybe we go with the last question. One last question um, sort of ties into this a little bit. Um, and Lakshmi is saying that both of the filmmaker subjects are based uh, in a conservative Muslim society with strong patriarchal values, as we've heard. Um, and did you face any sort of oppositions um, that you had to face while creating and writing the content? And also any usage of codes or conventions that were portrayed um, that you used in, in creating the film. Um, yeah, how, how was that for you working with these girls and women in, in the films? Uh, not really. I haven't faced any uh, this type of issue. Although I was worried about that, I, uh, I was aware that it might cause, cause it's a very strong patriarchal culture and uh, yeah most of my uh, it's not intentionally that i picked like a uh, muslim background uh, subjects it's just like happened to be the stories uh, was like i i got a lot of stories but the stories were more appealing and the subjects were agreed to be on camera because i found a lot of subjects a lot of stories came to me as i mentioned that came up to me they would like to share their story but not everyone was comfortable to talk in on camera so uh my that was uh like my concern because i wanted my subject it's a it's a documentary film it's not an investigative journalism right so i don't want to cover their face and sure and it's very hard to follow some characters uh for a feature length documentary just uh, covering their face uh, like continuously so i didn't want that uh that's why uh uh, like I picked those subjects because the uh, story was appealing and they trusted me and they were comfortable uh, sharing their story on camera. So it, it is not actually on purpose that uh, the, all my subjects are happen to be uh, like a Muslim background. Um, well, for me, while filming, if you ask me, I think uh, I was aware that this is, you know, this is Muslim society with a strong patriarchal values there. But at the same time, I say that, you know, I, I made sure that I, I was always, you know, I strategized my timing and, and the places where I, I was going for filming. I made sure that there is someone around us or, you know, uh, to take care of like the whole locations or understand what's happening. It's ba basically local surfers who, who helped me around uh, in the production. But uh, if you ask me for creative, uh, creating and write the, you know, creating the story and writing the story, um, I will say one thing. This is, this is something that as a, as a Bangladeshi filmmaker, I felt that was throwing back at me again and again. That was that whenever we were showing cuts, there were, there were comments that I felt it was more of how people internationally are used to seeing Bangladeshi women or portray Bangladeshi women as in vulnerable or, you know, the, my story talks about strong women. They are, trying to break the barriers they are get, getting out of the, the, the they are trying to leave their dream and, and trying to break the barriers so it's it's it gives a different context which i think world has world don't see every day and done by a local bangladeshi filmmaker so i think there were moments when you know i felt like barriers coming from outside the country <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, people wanted to 
see a story in a different way, which I didn't want to make. So it was, it was, I was lucky with the team, I must say, post-production team and my producer and, and the whole team that understood that what me, what was my vision that to, to, it is not my vision, I must say, it's, it's the vision of these girls. They wanted to tell their stories. So after watching the footage, like if someone really feels that, what is this story about? Like, it is, this is not traditional, I would say poverty or child marriage focused only. This shows the different side of, 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 of the coin too. It's not like only that, of course it's there, but it shows a different side. So I think that was something I fought and yeah, <laughs> I am getting some good response and I'm, I'm lucky that people are taking it um, positively and through hot dogs, there were really, really um, some positive, uh, yeah, feedback I got. I mean, through it, through, though, it, though it's virtual. <laughs> But, hey. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you so much, Azana, for being with us today. I'm going to give it back to Simone now. Uh, and I just, to wrap up, I just want to say that it's wonderful to be in this WIFTI webinar with two directors who are brought together through a WIFTI connection. So, you know, more power to sisterhood and more power to diversity. Thank you. And I give it to you, Simone. Here, here. That that uh, is, is definitely um, a great sentiment. Uh, you have given so much to this conversation. Uh, so thank you on behalf of WIFTI. It, it was just excellent and really important, the topics and your openness and generosity uh, about being a woman, about, uh, about the cultural, attitudes and in what you are facing and also about your craft so really important and this is what we're all about at, in these WIFTI webinars so uh, I personally um, want to thank you as well as from WIFTI uh, and Robiat, thank you for hosting and moderating such yeah, a great conversation uh, so thank you everyone out there for listening today and for your engagement and your great, really, really great questions. Um, our next webinar is going to be in June with Kristen Baker from Tilo Films in the US and her work as a distributor and a director and an LGBTQ activist. So if you haven't already, please uh, sign up, stay in touch. I think uh, yep, Regina is putting our newsletter link uh, in the chat. So uh, please keep in touch with us and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. So until then, have a lovely morning, afternoon, thank evening you. across the world, wherever you are. So, and thank you. Thank you, Simone. Thank Thanks you, Rupa. Thank you, Regina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.